Thank you everyone for taking time to attend our session. Really appreciate it. My name is Sadiq. I'm working as a cloud success architect uh, for Asia Pacific, currently living in Singapore. So today uh, we are going to talk about the basic architecture of uh, over cloud containerized deployment with a focus on troubleshooting. Before we start, just two things. We, are, uh, we prepared our presentation using OpenStack Cunes. So there could be some, something in not in sync with compared to the latest Rocky release. So we apologize for that. Then we wanted to, the next thing we wanted to focus on advanced troubleshooting, but uh, without focusing on the basic troubleshooting and basic architecture, there is no point in going to advanced troubleshooting. And we don't have enough time to cover everything, uh, basic troubleshooting and advanced troubleshooting. So we will focus our presentation on basic architecture of the deployment process and the basic architecture of the our cloud, then uh, we, know, we should explain how to troubleshoot if you come across some issues. And over to you, Dev. Thanks, Sadiq. Welcome, everyone, to the OpenStack Summit. My name is Devendra Shanbag. I work as a senior consultant with Red Hat. So quick look at the agenda today. We've got two sections here, containerized deployed deployment in the first part. And in the second part, we'll be speaking about a deep, deep dive into containerized overclock. So in the interest of time, and because we've got a lot to cover here, we're going to keep the Q&As to the end of the presentation. Quick note about Triple O. So with Triple O, we have two clouds. The undercloud, which is the operator-facing cloud, and the overcloud, which is the tenant-facing cloud. In a typical deployment, we use the undercloud and deploy the undercloud first, which is used to deploy and manage the overcloud. Now, let's look at a traditional deployment. Um, in a traditional deployment, you have pre-built images and all the packages installed and base configuration done. Uh, you have heat, which builds the puppet configuration and on the overcloud nodes and the OpenStack services. Um, and also all the OpenStack services sharing the same underlying libraries. Now, fast forward into triple load containerized deployment. Now, in a containerized deployment, we have all the system D managed services containerized. All the services still remain the same, but they're all in a contrast format. So instead of running package-based services managed by system D, we have all the services inside a container running on the same hardware. So the only obvious difference that we see here is the deployment of the services are on containers in a container runtime managed by Docker. What, what does this bring to us? So having containers brings us a great deal of flexibility. It's easier to move containers around. Um, in terms of upgrades uh, or rollbacks, it's easier to do that. Uh, it's easier to scale the deployments, and because containers have an immutable infrastructure, they are secure as well. Now, quick look at the deployment workflow here, um, and the key thing to note is all the containers require a registry to pull the images from. The overcloud does that by connecting to the remote registry and pulls the images directly on each node. Um, and this has to be done for the each node. So in that case, you have a lot of network bandwidth that is required, and all the nodes require an internet connection. Instead, we use something called as a local registry. So a local registry is created that syncs all the containers uh, to the local registry from a remote registry and makes a copy. This, in turn, speeds up the deployment 
and it also decreases network congestion. Now, better than having a local registry, the only problem with it, that is you have basic functionality with a local registry. So we recommend using satellite to sync all the images, container images from the remote registry to a satellite server. Now, just deep dive into the key components of the container build. We have Kola that provides container images and scripts. We have Ponge, that's a library that is used to start or deploy the containers. And we have something called as Docker Puppet, a Puppet uh, a Python script that is responsible for generating the configuration. And finally, for updates and upgrades, we have Ansible within the triple O heat templates. Quick look at uh, dockerpuppet.py. So dockerpuppet.py is responsible for generating the configuration for each of the services and running Puppet inside the container. It takes the Docker Puppet JSON as an input and puts that into the container to generate the configuration. The way it works is you have two config files, the valid config data and all the services inside the container. It's basically a full config tree. And valid Puppet generated, which only is responsible for the files that is modified by Puppet. And finally, it generates a checksum, which then tells Ponge that the configuration has changed and to restart the container. So once Docker Puppet generates the configuration, how do we have the container started? So Kola is, a utility, uh, project, Kola is a project that builds the container images and has all the containerized services and startup scripts. So like I said before, uh, we have all the configuration that's put inside the container and the config di directory also put in the container. And Kola start um, copies the configuration on each of the containers, sets permissions, um, and then starts the container process. Here we're just taking a quick look at how a config.json for a particular service looks like. We see uh, the permissions being set on the container, on the, on the files, the command that it's supposed to run, which is start the service, and the source, which is the caller config source files. Some important directories that I've, we've listed here. Um, so we have bad lib config data, and the service names, which have the full copy of the tree, uh, of the container tree, which is basically HC and all the services inside it. We have valid config data Puppet generated, which has configuration files only that is modified by Puppet. Um, and then we have valid triple O config and Docker Puppet, which is managed by Docker. Just a quick look at how the bind mounts look inside a container and a host. So what you see on, on the underlying host is var lock containers keystone is bind mounted inside the container as var lock keystone. Networking on the containers does not, containerized deployment does not change. What you see on the host is what you see on the containers as well. Even log files for all the containers deployment are bind mounted. So in the container, you'll find the logs in their usual location, which is HC, oh, sorry, var log and the service name Neutron Nova. And on the bare metal host, you'll see it under var log container and the services. Finally, let's take a quick look at uh, a stack update, which I'm trying to do uh, to deploy OVN on the OverCloud. Um, 
So basically, my stack update has failed, complaining about a Docker image not being found. First thing you'd probably look at is the config file that uh, you've uh, generated using the OpenStack Overcloud container prepare and all the containers in your local registry, which clearly states that the OVN containers are missing. So next up, we, we include that in the container prepare command and rerun it. So here we have a diff of what was it, what was the con uh, container registry before and the one with the local registry, with the OVN containers present. This brings us to the end of the first part of the presentation. Just over to Sadiq. Thank you, Dev. So Dev clearly explained how Triploid deploys a containerized over cloud. So he first gave you insight into how Kola can be used to build the images, then how you can configure various uh, sources for, to, to push the images so that the overcloud can use those images and pull those images during the deployment. He then shared some light on how, what is the purpose of the Ponge and how Ponge is being used to kickstart various uh, containers during the deployment process, both one-shot containers and other containers and, uh, during the deployment process. Then uh, he explained how the bind mode works in the background. Then uh, he also focused a little bit on how Kola Start is, is being used uh, to orchestrate the OpenStack services within the containers. And uh, then he gave an example on how to approach a basic troubleshooting uh, that can happen, uh, deployment failure brings into the picture. So now let's shift our focus a little bit into explain how does an our cloud deployment and an end result of the deployment looks like from a containerized architecture perspective. So, um, uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the high availability of the containers. So we need, for a lot of various OpenStack supporting services, we need high availability. So um, we have been using Pacemaker to deliver the high availability for various supporting services. And the good news is that we still use Pacemaker. And traditionally, we use Pacemaker to make the service highly available. So for example, uh, MySQL Galera, uh, RabbitMQ, uh, Redis are some of the examples. So we cannot just manage the containers the way we manage, uh, Pacemaker manage the, the services directly. So that is why Pacemaker introduced a new feature called uh, bundles. So what does this mean is you are going to pass a lot of values, uh, in, uh, options into the Pacemaker startup command. So one being the location of the image, the second being uh, what type of networking is going to be used for these containers. Then third, uh, the number of replicas. Then whether how many masters or how many slaves, something like that. Then finally, what is going to be the command that is going to orchestrate or being started? In most of the cases, this is Kola start. So uh, Pacemaker will take all these arguments and depending upon how many replicas that you have configured, this is going to create a bundle of containers distributed into multiple bare metal control plane nodes. So uh, this is what uh, we have. So we have various services, as I explained. So one is Galera, MariaDB, then RabbitMQ, and Redis. These three services, uh, Pacemaker cannot just manage the containers. So Pacemaker need a little bit of intelligence and uh, exposure into the application inside the container so that it can do various activities like bootstrapping and, and other steps directly on the application. So uh, we need a way to, to do that, and that is why the pacemaker going to start pacemaker remote D inside the containers, and then pacemaker remote D is basically going to orchestrate the, the application, bootstrapping the application inside the, the containers. This is not for all the containers. It's like explained only for the three containers that need special intelligence to bootstrap the application. So um, uh, I have a next slide, another slide that I explain this process, step-by-step uh, -step process involved in this. So these are the one type of containers that Pacemaker makes highly available. Uh, the second type of containers are HA proxy and uh, Cinder, uh, Cinder volumes I will explain later. So HA proxy, it, 
this does, pacemaker does not need any kind of intelligence or access into the HA proxy that is running inside a container. What it does need is it just needs to start, stop, uh, and make the container itself highly available. So we will say pacemaker, uh, you directly go and manage the bundle of containers created for HA proxy. And Cinder volumes, obviously, it is still running as active passive in a default deployment. So we need to configure Cinder volumes as uh, with just one replica so that the, the pacemaker will ensure that only one container of, of Cinder volume is running at a time. So uh, the other thing is that pacemaker service itself is not containerized. Plus, the virtual IPs that, that using which we access APIs are also not containerized. They are also running as the, just like the standalone services uh, on, on the control plane. And uh, let's take just one example of how the, the uh, container bundles are built for MySQL Galera. So um, uh, we have the container, and we have the config.json this config.json and the config dir is something that is generated during the deployment as explained by Dev during the do using the Docker puppet. And these are available on the bare metal system, and these are bind mounted into the container, along with all other supporting files like Warlow containers, and there are a lot more. Uh, then uh, once uh, this configuration the container takes, and we specify that Cola start is going to be the process that should orchestrate the application inside the, the container, each container. Then what, what you see here is the, the Cola start is going to be the first process that is going to orchestrate the services inside the container. Then uh, what the Cola start actually does is it reads the config.json that is already bind mounted and it first does uh, copy all the configuration files from the config dir that is bind mounted inside the root directory of the of the container. So the the configuration files inside the the bind mounted configuration file has a root structure starting with a etc or whatever. So once it is copied in the root directory, you will get the full hierarchy of the configuration files inside the container. The next step. Uh, it, it is going to set various permissions for various files and directories. So if it is a MySQL container, that, that means the var log MySQL need uh, a permission or ownership to be set accordingly. Then once this is set, then since this is a special bun container bundles, uh, we cannot just tell you start the process or Galera process. But it, the caller start does is, is it in fact going to start the pacemaker remote D inside the container. Okay, from here, what happens, then pacemaker remotely is started, then the pacemaker on the bare metal node or the control plane node is going to talk to the pacemaker remotely inside the container, and using the resource agents, so resource agent is Galera resource agent, it has a lot of configurations associated with how the, the Galera need to be started. It is going to send that configuration into the pacemaker remotely, and pacemaker remotely is going to basically orchestrate uh, the Galera application in or service inside the container, each and every container. So we have some more details on how the resource agent looks like in the, the next slides. So this is how a PCS status looks like uh, inside one of the control plane node. So we do have the first three bundles are the bundles created uh, for uh, MySQL, RabbitMQ, and uh, Redis. And the VIPs are not containerized, and the last two are basically the container sets for HA proxy and Cinder volumes. So this is not the only containers managed by Pacemaker because if you use OVN, then the OVN database is there that is containerized. So we haven't uh, explored that in detail here. And whatever you see, the guest online and the online, the online nodes are the number of controller nodes, physical controller nodes. The guest online are the containers with pacemaker remotely running inside it, in, inside the containers. Then uh, this is how um, the PCS resource show just show you an example for the Galera looks like. And you see the uh, the first line is I cannot see it here. So the first line is basically uh, the configuration for the container, where, what is the location for the image, 
and uh, number of replicas and the call, what process that need to be started. Then you see the second one is the control port. The control port is uh, what is decides what should be the port, the pacemaker remotely inside the container is going to listen. So by default, it's, it, it, there is one port. So we cannot use the default port because uh, there should be a conflict. Because we have three different containers running pacemaker remotely, one for Galera, Rabbit, and Ready. So there cannot be a conflict between the, the ports running inside each container. So we, we need to manually specify different ports for different set of bundles. Then we have the bind mount configuration for, for that specific process. Then uh, the last section is the resource agent configuration, where, uh, the, where we are going to tell how to build the Pacemic uh, Galera cluster. What are the nodes, that container nodes that is going to be in the uh, cluster, and how to do various activity. Uh, I mean, how, to, how should, should the Pacemaker remotely orchestrate the service inside it. So that's about the uh, containers managed by Pacemaker remotely. If you see, uh, there aren't too many containers managed by Pacemaker. Then we do have the standalone containers. So uh, the standalone containers are, uh, most of the containers fall into this category. They are basically stateless, most of the API services. And uh, we use Docker to directly, tell Docker to directly manage these containers. So um, uh, the configuration is generated during the deployment, and we do have the Docker restart always set to yes, so that the Docker will start and stop these containers. So um, uh, there is no dependency between these containers, because if one container goes down, there is nothing to, to bring up except, except the default high availability in do Docker. So what happens is we have HA proxy that is being managed by Pacemaker. HA proxy is going to load balance uh, API requests into these containers. So HA proxy is responsible to ensure that it is it's not sent API request into the container that has gone down. So even if one container goes down, it doesn't matter. We do have rest of the two containers where HA proxy can send requests. Then uh, another set of uh, standalone containers are uh, it, managed or communicated, they communicate with each other using RabbitMQ. So there are basically, some of the examples are Nova scheduler, uh, neutron agents, uh, Nova conductor, and there are a lot more. So the high availability for these, these are also standalone containers, and there is no API access into this, and this uses RabbitMQ, and they just get registered with the RabbitMQ, and, and uh, uh, all of the containers for example, if we have three Nova scheduler, all the three Nova scheduler container will get re registered into RabbitMQ. Even if one of them goes down, the RabbitMQ still has two of the containers registered that can actually uh, serve the request or do the task. So that's why these containers are still standalone containers managed by, directly by uh, Docker itself. Now, uh, let's, uh, this, uh, what, what I've explained till now are the containers that exist on the control plane. So now, uh, each compute node is also containerized to some extent. So that most of the services within a compute plane, compute node is, uh, for example, uh, the libword, the Nova compute, and uh, Celiometer agent. Uh, uh, Nova migration target is uh, another container where uh, SSHD runs listening to, into a port, and it actually to accept incoming call migration requests from other hypervisors. So um, all of the supporting services are containerized, and just like uh, they are also standalone containers directly managed by Docker. And at this time, at the time of the Qunes release, open vSwitch that runs on the compute node is not containerized. It just runs as a standalone service. And all the VMs, by saying VMs, I mean the QMUK VM process that manages the VMs are also not containers, just like a, uh, just a Linux process like in the previous releases. Now uh, let's cover a little bit into Ceph uh, OSD node. So this Ceph OSD node, uh, 
is deployed by a director, and director uses Ceph Ansible to deploy it, and Ceph 3.0 has support for containerization. So uh, the containers in Ceph OSD nodes works a little bit uh, in a different way. So that means uh, we, for each OSD, each OSD is a disk, for example, SDA, SDB, and SDC. And for each OSD, we are going to have a systemd process created, a systemd service created, and inside the systemd service, we are going to call osd run.sh and the name of the, the device. And what it does is it calls the docker current command and, and it passes the uh, OSD details, the device, and everything to the Docker command, uh, current com Docker command. And the Docker is actually going to create a container for that, for that OSD. So each OSD is a container inside the OSD node. If you have uh, 10, 20, or 30 OSD nodes, you will see uh, 30 OSD containers. And each, each container has the specific disk exclusive access into the specific disk. And that disk where you, you get the OSD created. So, uh, so the, the important thing is here is that you should not be managing these containers using Docker or Pacemaker or anything, but these are simple systemd services where you can manage each OSD using systemd services. So um, if you think that the control plane services are the only one containerized, you are wrong. So we do have a lot of services that spawns containers. For example, uh, Neutron. So um, you know that Neutron traditionally responsible to automate your networking. So that involves uh, creating networks. So when you create networks, that means if you enable DSCP, the DSCP agent is going to spawn at the DSCP server, which in turn spawns a DNS mask, DNS mask process to serve that container. So just like that, you have a Neutron Layer 3 agent. And when it comes to Neutron Layer 3 agent, Layer 3 agent is responsible to create a namespace, plus um, uh, on each and every bare metal node, depends upon the configuration then uh, start a keep LIVD process. And the keep LIVD process will manage uh, uh, hooking the IP address into the namespace and enable routing for the virtual routers created by end users. So this is one of my favorite topic because this can make the scale of containers in the control plane really unpredictable, depending upon how many users are there, how many of them are going to, to start, and how many networks and routers. So what happens is, in, in, with containerization, each network DSCP server DNS mask process is a container that is spread across multiple uh, bare, uh, control plane nodes. What does this mean? This mean is that we need high availability for the DSCP services. So we, for single network, depending upon the configuration, the default is three uh, DSCP servers. We are going to uh, basically uh, create three DNS mask process on each of the control plane node. That means 100 networks, you are going to end up 300 containers just for the network DSCP services. And just like for the routing also, so you, if you, you have uh, Keep LIVD, but uh, Keep LIVD will be hooking the IP address only on one container. And for each router, it is a container with the namespace and IP hook into that namespace. And they are going to form a heartbeat network for the Keep LFD to work between the containers. Then uh, we do have the metadata services. So that metadata services is uh, hooked into the uh, router, if you have a router. If you ha do not have a router, it is hooked into the DSCP agent. The example here shows uh, the metadata service uh, hooked into the router. So each uh, metadata service for each router is going to be another container. So that means uh, how, how this is done is we have a Neutron DSCP agent, we have a Neutron Layer 3 agent. The layer 3 agent is a container. This container has Docker clients installed in it, and these Docker clients can contact the Docker service on the, on the control plane and can spawn 
different containers for each and every network and router being created by the end user. And the container that is being created by the end, uh, by, by the, so then also a different container gets created for the neutron network namespace. And the neutron uh, routers running in a container is going to contact or reach out to the uh, metadata agent container for the metadata access, which is another container. They share the same namespace. If, if, you, see, if you look at, I don't have an example here. So uh, the first one is a, is a container that where a DSCP DNS mass process runs. The second one is, a, sorry, the first one is a Q router uh, layer three agent, I believe. And the second one is a metadata agent container. So inside the metadata agent container, it is going to run an HA proxy process. The HA proxy process will listen for the metadata port, and once it gets a request, it just sends it to a uh, metadata socket, proxy stock socket. Then the last one is a different container spawned for, to enable DSCP services inside a, uh, for, for a network. And uh, I said uh, the, the namespace for the uh, routing uh, and metadata proxy is shared. They, they all run the same namespace, so we are using the shared flag to, to bypass the names, uh, to pass the namespace into both the containers. So let's focus a little bit on troubleshooting. These are simple tips and tricks for you to troubleshoot. So um, uh, just like I explained, it's very, very important to understand how the containers are started, stopped, and managed for various purposes. What are the containers that is being started and stopped or managed by pacemaker? What are the containers uh, managed by uh, Docker itself? And what are the containers that are managed by systemd? And what are the containers that is managed by a different container, like the, I explained in the neutron use case. There is another use case in Cinder also, where each, if you use the NFS backend for a Cinder, each mount request is going to be served in a different container. So, uh, so we need a clear distinction. You need to understand the clear distinction between all these types of containers to efficiently troubleshoot. There's no point in, in uh, playing with the Docker start and stop command to work when you work with a pacemaker managed container. It's, it's, it's going, not going to help you to troubleshoot anything. And the second, some of the Docker commands that you can always use, like Docker stats, Docker top, which will give you some of the monitoring information from within the container. And most important, they can use docker inspect command to see the, the configuration of the container. And if you look at the log files, and the log files, you should not be looking at the default log file location, because every log file location is bind mounted into the container, and they reside on var log containers, and the name of the container is Nova, Neutron, or depending upon the, the service. And if you want to enable debugging for troubleshooting purposes, there are multiple ways to do that. And uh, one way is you directly log into the container and then change it on the fly. So um, uh, this will not survive a restart. But if you need to make changes permanently into the container, you can uh, actually edit the bind mounted file which is, uh, resides at the puppet generator directory. That is one option, uh, but for Configuration that is going, configuration changes that is going to remain forever. Uh, you are recommended to do it through triple O orchestration. Then the finally, if you want, if you find some bugs and you want to rebuild the container with a fix for the bug, you have multiple ways to do that. So um, you can create a Docker file, then say uh, I'm going to change this file. The changed file is there. You copy that into the container, or I have a new. RPM package, you install this new fixed patch RPM package inside the container image, then rebuild the container image, then you just run a triple O stack update so that the container gets updated uh, with the new code. So, so but for, for a permanent fix, it's better you download the patched uh, image or patched container image and re, uh, re, uh, do a stack update. So these are some of the troubleshooting steps for you, for you to get start with. And by this, thank you everyone for your time. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer.
Do you hear me? So I've been playing a bit around with the Red Hat OpenStack like Platform 12, and we had to do some customizations to some of our services, and uh, we saw that there are basically three ways to change your container. Either, either is to rebuild the container from a Docker file, or you do it with Puppet and the uh, varlib Puppet generated uh, folder, or then you, then you mount some folder from the host. And so basically, I'm a bit confused. What is the best way to customize your containers? Because there are many ways to do it, no? Yeah, I, I didn't hear you properly, everything. But yeah. uh, I understand your question is the, the configuration is generated uh, using a container, special container using Docker Puppet. Yeah. And the Docker Puppet is just going to copy that configuration file into multiple locations. One location, it is going to copy the entire configuration for that specific service. Mm -hmm. Then the second location is only the files changed by Puppet is going to be generated, which is going to be bind mounted into, into the container. You are asking, is, that, is there any better way to manage this? Or is this the best way to? Yeah, so what is the recommended way to customize the contents of a container? If you want to do something which is non-standard, um, I had some troubles to find the best way, let's say. Yeah, so I can hear you properly, there's a problem. Yeah, so uh, I, I was wondering what is the best way to do the customization of a container so you can do it from the mounts, from the host, you can do it uh, changing the Docker file in your uh, container registry, and you can uh, also do it with Puppet. And so it's a bit tricky for me to see. Yeah, so to, uh, it depends on yeah. how, what is the preferred way for you. Mm. Yeah, so if you want the vendor, uh, a patch delivered by a vendor, then you want to, to run that container because that you will remain fully supported, then it's better that you inform the vendor and get a patched container mm. so that you can run it. But if, the, if this is test environment or something like that, or staging environment, or you don't need, uh, or you have in-house uh, expertise to develop the patch, rebuild the container images, and uh, uh, deploy and upload, pull the, push that into the container registry mm. so that the worker can pull that. It, it depends on what is comfortable to you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, hey, I'm just wondering what's the value of running Galera and uh, Rabbit through Pacemaker while they have their own clustering built in? Your question is the Galera and Rabbit is running inside uh, by Pacemaker, and what is the purpose of uh, running it through the Pacemaker, right? Uh, because one thing, uh, this need uh, special orchestration inside the container. That means, uh, for, for example, uh, for, for Galera, uh, if all the three nodes are down, you need to decide which, you don't know basically which Galera node has the latest copy of the database. So if you just start the Galera service inside the container, then uh, you may lose, depend upon the which, no, Galera need a bootstrapping, so it depends upon which node you start first is going to be the master, which may not have the latest copy of the database, so you lose a lot of data in, during that process. So what Pacemaker is going to do is, one, it has a resource agent. Once all the nodes are up, it is going to find out automatically, looking at the database, which the node is, has the latest copy of the database, and use that node to bootstrap the Galera services, so that you will not lose any data. So that is the main purpose of one, to, to bring Galera under Pacemaker. It needs special intelligence to start, to automate the bootstrap process. To anyway, uh, the second thing, if one of the Galera node goes down, there is no way to, to recover that node unless until there is someone who, who can recover that node. This is not applicable uh, for the other standalone services in, in all, all, all sense. But the first thing that I explained, the special intelligence required to bootstrap the services application inside the container is the reason, the main reason to bring Galera under pacemaker. There is also the true for 
uh, RabbitMQ to, to circumvent some of the bugs, uh, some, some bugs, I don't recall the bugs, that need special intelligence built into the, uh, into the application to, to orchestrate it. No, when, when Galera goes down and early, uh, you need to bootstrap it. It will not automatically bootstrap. So when you manually do this, you can do and uh, choose whichever node has the latest copy look, looking at the sequence number. But in an actual deployment, don't you need automation for this? And automatically, uh, someone goes and looks and which Galera node has the latest sequence number and use that to bootstrap. That is the special purpose inside the using Pacemaker. And HA proxy is brought under Pacemaker because it has dependency on the VIP. So the VIP must run where, I mean, they need to run together. So there's no point in failing over VIP without ensuring that HA proxy is running on that node. So, so that is why only these services are brought under the Pacemaker control. Yeah, let's discuss in detail. So the idea is uh, to, to give some intelligence, get some intelligence, and go directly into the application and do special orchestration. I think we are already out of time. There aren't any questions. Thank you, everyone, for Thank you. joining. And you'll be around. Let's talk.